Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to serve as a moderator for this important Google Hangout discussion on the future of value-based payment in the Medicare program. Now, as most of you know, in April 2015, the President signed into law the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, HR2, also known as MACRA. Now, MACRA replaced the existing physician payment formula under Medicare, known as the Sustainable Growth Rate, or SGR, which had been in place since 1997, and uh, Congress had to vote to overrule the uh, scheduled physician fee cuts under S the SGR 17 times since its enactment. So MACRA is indeed a historic law, and it streamlines and advances efforts to move away from fee-for-service towards value-based payment in the Medicare program in two important ways. First, it puts into place something called MIPS, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, which will incorporate quality metrics into payment. Second, it encourages physicians to move towards alternative payment models, or APMs, which include arrangements such as patient-centered medical homes. So today, we're going to talk about the future of implementation of MACRA, which has to move on a very aggressive timeline. And in order to make the most of this historic opportunity, the NCQA, the National Committee for Quality Assurance, has put forward a white paper with five core principles for implementation of MACRA. And so we're very pleased today to have Margaret O'Kane, the president of NCQA, who is going to explain these five principles. And then we have two other distinguished speakers who are going to talk about the impact on patients and on physicians. We will hear from Lauren Kennedy, the director of health policy at the National Partnership for Women and Families, about the impact of MACRA implementation on patients, consumers, and their families. And we will then also hear from Dr. Randy Kuno on what this means for physicians and other clinicians. Randy is president of Mercy Health Physicians in Cincinnati, Ohio, and he also chairs NCQA's Clinical Programs Committee, which oversees its PCMH and PCSP programs, and that's patient-centered medical homes and patient-centered specialty programs. So a lot of acronyms for you today. So most importantly, we also want to hear from you, our participants, on what your thoughts and questions are moving forward. So if you have access to Twitter, please log on and you can tweet your questions to the hashtag MACRAVision, that's M-A-C-R-A vision, and we'll get to your questions following the panelists' presentations. So it's my pleasure now to turn to Margaret O'Kane uh, to talk about NCQA's white paper and vision moving forward. Peggy? Thank you, Sarah, and thanks to Laura, Randy, and all of you for taking the time to discuss this important topic with us today. MACRA is an enormous opportunity to promote better quality and move the value agenda forward. And that value agenda means we get more health for our, our healthcare dollar. We can give clinicians the incentives and alignment they need to focus on providing the best quality and at the lowest cost. It also can give consumers the tools they need to better shop for value in healthcare. The law's broad bipartisan and multi-stakeholder support is powerful validation for the work we all have been doing over the past 25 years. This achievement, however, requires that we act now to fill gaps and promote the harmonization across payers needed for optimal value-based payment. Our white paper lays out five proposed principles for that optimal state. Number one, Every Medicare enrollee needs a dedicated and well-organized primary care team that can serve as the hub of their care. Principle two, measurement must be specified appropriately for each different unit of accountability. Principle three, measurement should support rapid improvement and clinical decision making. Principle four, a course of measures will let all stakeholders make comparisons across programs. Let me just say a little bit more about that. That means that if I'm a Medicare beneficiary and I'm trying to choose across different kinds of options like ACOs, MA plans, and so forth, or classic Medicare, then I should be able to have information that allows me to see, you know, what is it going to cost me and what kind of quality can I get with different options. And then the fifth is quality measure results should be easy for consumers and payers to get and use. And obviously, policymakers want to see where do we get the best 
uh, outcomes for our national spending on health care, which of course is very, very high. So we look forward to hearing today from our panelists and from you, our participants, on these ideas and the best way to move forward. So uh, let's get started. Thank you, Peggy. And now we'll turn to Lauren Kennedy from the National Partnership for Women and Families. Lauren? Thank you, and thank you so much for having me uh, today. Uh, so, as others have mentioned, MACRA presents an important opportunity to shift our healthcare system towards rewarding quality and value rather than volume. And to the consumer, what this means is not only having better information to be able to choose high quality providers, uh, but also a key question around what will this mean for the care that they receive? To the consumer, the full potential of the macro law is really, will it result in what matters to me, uh, which is consumers, we believe, is delivery of coordinated, high-quality, patient-centered care. At the National Partnership, we believe that MACRA has very strong potential to propel delivery system reform, and we highly commend the law's support for patient-centered medical homes and alternative payment models that promote care coordination. From our perspective, reform through patient-centered medical homes and through APMs uh, must be grounded in transformed primary care. Uh, and for these reasons, we strongly support NCQA's principles uh, and the vision that it's laid out for deliver, or, excuse me, payment reform uh, in Medicare. If we had to identify which of these principles may be most critical for consumers, uh, we'd probably start with the first principle uh, that Peggy mentioned, that every Medicare enrollee needs a dedicated and well-organized primary care team. Uh, at the partnership, we strongly believe that truly centered patient medical homes are grounded in comprehensive, well-coordinated primary care and that exemplar patient-centered medical homes utilize care teams that meaningfully partner with patients and family caregivers at all levels of care, that they provide ready access to care, address patients' unique needs and preferences, and provide safe, timely, and effective care. And relatedly, we also believe that alternative payment models must be founded upon these same principles, uh, that they have promised to provide comprehensive, coordinated care, and that they, to achieve better health outcomes, propel a commitment to quality improvement and to making this type of information highly transparent to consumers and patients and family caregivers. So in addition to Principle A, we also are very excited uh, to, to also hone in on the Principle C, D, and E around uh, measurement, supporting rapid improvement in clinical decision making, a core set of measures uh, that uh, allow stakeholders to make comparisons across programs and quality measures results that should be easy for consumers and payers to get and use. All of these things will be critical to ensuring that the macro law uh, is successful, not just in terms of driving us towards value-based care, uh, but also in propelling the delivery system transformation that we know patients want and need. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Now let's turn to Dr. Randy Kernow. Thank you. Um, the MACRA um, regulations have been um, well seen by physicians as a way to finally get the uh, payment incentives aligned to support our quality improvement efforts. Um, essentially, this is really important because it enables physicians to really get out from under the boot of the fee-for-service model, which has been really crippling physicians' ability to align delivery for patients and health systems. Um, that includes much needed finance, financial support for Medicare, um, which is the dominant pair for most physicians, and for Medicare shared savings programs and the patient-centered specialty practices that we spoke of earlier. We all know that these patient-centered delivery models improve quality, cost, and patient experience, and really aligning these the right models of practice with payment reform has been the true missing ingredient for physicians as they try to um, bridge this gap towards a value-based future that can really drive on the triple aim. That's why it's that's why ongoing financial support is so critical, and having Medicare contribute to the ongoing support is critical to future to success. I think all the principles are important to take the outline, but for clinicians, probably the first three are the most important. First, that every patient has a dedicated primary care team 
which will be able to address the current fragmentation of care delivery that makes quality improvement and really help patients navigate this bewildering maze of care delivery options for them that there's no incentive for at this time to align. Having a core set of measures that apply across payment models with measures specific for the needs and abilities is important. It's for the ability to, for physicians to drive care delivery improvement has been greatly forestalled by the complex soup of different measures that the various payers have. And standardizing this is critically important to the future of being able to get everyone on the same page. As physicians move from solo fee for service to PCMHs and PCSPs, again, we all love acronyms today, um, APMs and, even, and on to more organized delivery systems, their ability to improve and earn value-based payment rewards also increases. So as we move forward, there'll be increasingly more alignment towards supporting physicians, supporting patients and getting the care that they need at the right time, at the right place, by the right Helping clinicians to move up that continuum is a key goal of MACRA and of the overall value-based agenda. And finally, making sure that measures support rapid improvement in clinical decision-making is also pivotal. Right now, the average physician does not get very good data on how they're doing and how their population is doing, maybe once or twice a year. And getting that done in a more rapid fashion and continue that enables for continuous quality improvement is the key to moving forward. Anything we can do to that speed up and ultimately gives doctors feedback as to real time as close as possible will speed up our efforts to transform care. That too should be a key goal for MACRA and the overall value-based agenda. And that's all I have for you, Sarah. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Carnell. So um, let me kick it off with a question. And um, for those of you who are participating um, in this Google Hangout, you can tweet your questions using the hashtag MacroVision. That's hashtag MacroVision. Uh, but first, let me let me kick this off. You all emphasize the importance of primary care, and that's actually the first principle on the NCQA white paper. So so let me ask a couple of questions from both the patient perspective and then also from the um, clinician perspective. So from the patient perspective, how do we um, make sure that um, patients um, can have a dedicated primary care team without locking them into a doctor that they, they may not want to see? Um, that's, that's part one of that question. And then part two is, uh, for practices that are just starting out, for some of the smaller practices, uh, for practices that maybe haven't um, gotten into the, the, the patient center medical home or other kinds of models yet, what is, uh, what is the first step for them to move towards transformation and what's it going to take and, and who's going to help them do that? So does anyone want to start us off? Yeah, let me start, Sarah. I, um, I think that what we need to do is align the incentives of patients and payers and the providers and physicians um, uh, all in the same direction towards highly coordinated care. So the idea is not to lock people into a medical home, but could there be an incentive, like with lower co-insurance, less out-of-pocket spending, if you go to your medical home instead of going to an emergency room? Or, you know, we see a lot of patients seeing many, many different doctors. They're, they're all not in touch with each other. So if you if you have them have an incentive to go to that medical home, that gives them a chance to coordinate the care. Um, I don't think anybody's talking about a lock-in. Thank you. Uh, this is Lauren. I think you know if I could just add on to that, uh, you know we would we operate off the premise that if uh, a, a primary care practice, uh, or if you scale it up to uh, an alternative payment model, such as an ACO, for example, uh, if that practice or that uh, larger integrated system is delivering the kind of care that patients want and need, you don't need lock-in. Uh, if you are really delivering on some of the tenants uh, that have been mentioned, coordinated care, personalized, whole person care, uh, a, a practice that enables ready access to care 24-7 uh, through, you know, for example, uh, easier scheduling, uh, telehealth type communications, same-day scheduling where, uh, where possible, 
Um, and that really engages patients at all levels of care. And when we use the term patient engagement, we mean partnership with patients at point of care through shared care planning, partnership with patients in the design and redesign of a primary care practice and how it goes about its, its workflow or in the design of a clinical care model for, say, an ACO. Uh, and that also you know, commits, again, to con continuous quality improvement practices or alternative payment models that, that really embed uh, these features into their clinical care models will be delivering uh, the type of patient and family-centered care that will act as an incentive for a patient to keep coming back to that practice and, and hopefully avoid uh, any uh, uh, type of need for lock-in uh, or you know, patient dissatisfaction, feeling that they've been aligned to a provider uh, that would not be their first choice. Uh, and you know, the last thing I'll mention is uh, you know, that NCQA and what they've set out in their vision paper for enabling patients and family caregivers to have uh, better access to transparent quality information and, and not just a um, quality information on, say, clinical process or outcomes, but also on patient reported outcomes and patient experience will also go a long way to helping patients make informed choices about their providers uh, so that they are hopefully happier uh, when they do commit to joining a practice. Thanks, Lauren. Dr. Kerna, did you want to comment on that? You're on mute, hear me? Now we can. Well, yeah, I think that, I think that um, this is where the consumer community and physicians are in complete agreement. No physician wants to lock anyone in anywhere. And as I'm fond of saying, most patients provide pretty good, get pretty good care most of the time in spite of the system, not because of it. Um, individual patients and physicians work hard to establish these relationships, but there is not, not enough amongst various silos. And that that's really the key to transforming this model is to get, as I said earlier, patients and physicians from under the boot of this fee-for-service model that only incentivizes touches. It doesn't um, incentivize coordination, um, care over time. And so it's very important that the macro and the NCQA's um, past programs in PCMH and PS PCSP really help drive that moving forward in the future. I'd like to go to Sarah's question about the small practices because I think uh, there are there are programs around the country where patient-centered medical homes have transformed, small practices have transformed, and then there's been a collaborative that has joined them together and that provides them information that they don't have access to, like claims data that tells them that their patient went to the hospital or somebody letting them know that their patient went to the hospital or the patient is planning to come out of the, being planned for discharge and to let them know that they're making an appointment for them. So there's a lot of ways to build up from the patient-centered medical home and the specialty practice that's more efficiently done uh, by a collaborative. Thank you, uh, Peggy. Now, um, let me ask, so we're, we're in a virtual uh, Google Hangout here, and um, there's mention in, in some of the, in the white paper, I believe, and in, in um, some of the um, responses to the RFI that CMS put out about uh, virtual uh, physician practices. Um, can you explain a little bit more about what that is and why that's important for well, virtual groups of physicians? From the provider perspective, um, the, getting access in the future, consumers getting access to care um, is going to be one of the main, main ways we frame success. And in the past, through no fault of physicians and providers, access has typically been defined by when the doctor's office is open, or what the office hours are. And that mind, mindset is really starting to thankfully transform into what is the that to provide a, con a continuum of care, what things do we need to do to make sure patients have the access that they need, and virtual visits is an important part of that. And it would just be as simple as someone you know, signing on. If you can get into Google Hangout, um, in the future you'll be, in the future is now, you'll be able to make a virtual visit with your provider or someone who represents your provider. And that's the kind of thing that people has been kind of standing in the way of 
um, you know, email. I mean, uh, prepaid group practices, which I assume are going to be one of the APMs in the future, um, they've been using email very effectively and telephonic visits and so forth. Um, and there's all kinds of things that we can do. Technology really is unleashing lots of ways to make care more accessible, more patient-centered, and more efficient and, and less costly. But we've got to get the payment system supporting what the technology can do. And I would agree with that, that, that this is what we hope to see through payment reform initiatives, that it really is uh, investing in the future of technology, both to improve access to care, uh, but also to empower patients to, to play um, the role as a partner in care decision making and in, uh, in treatment choice. So in addition to supporting telehealth and the, abil the ability to do virtual visits, how are we thinking about uh, health information technology, electronic health records, and really the future of uh, both those platforms to enable two-way communication between patients and providers so that shared care planning can be done, for example, uh, through uh, online uh, functionalities that patients have access to their own health uh, information and easy access to that information so that if they are in a virtual visit or they are uh, even going to the doctor's office, uh, that they're able to come in equipped uh, with the same amount of, of information, say, that the provider has. Um, so I, I think in addition to, to telehealth, how are we thinking about payment reform in terms of its investment in really moving the ball forward in health information technology uh, and, uh, and two-way communication between patients and providers? Thanks, Laura. So let's step back for a second to uh, the MIPS program, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment um, System, because some of the things that um, each of you has been talking about with the virtual visits, expanded hours, telehealth, uh, seems to fit into uh, a new component of this Merit-Based Incentive Payment System known as the Clinical Practice Improvement um, System. And, and um, for background, for um, those viewers who um, may not have known this, the MIPS uh, takes, consolidates, and streamlines three existing um, physician quality um, systems and then adds this new clinician, uh, sorry, clinical practice improvement system. So it takes the PQRS, the physician quality reporting system, the meaningful use incentives, and also the value-based payment modifier and um, streamlines and consolidates those and adds this new clinical practice improvement. So um, so how is that going to factor into physician payment? Um, does that, is, in your view, is that really going to accelerate um, practices' use of, of these new tools um, to engage patients and improve access? Well, Sarah, it's a little early for us to know for sure exactly how this is going to work. As you know, uh, CMS has put out two requests for information and um, has been kind of laying out a little bit at a time, and it's clear that they are on a timeline. I mean, this is this is very big transformation, and the timeline is short. So I think that they are appropriately trying to be very deliberate about each step that they have to take. Um, so I think some of the some of the questions you just asked to me are we don't know the answer yet. Um, we know that CMS is committed to simplifying the way measurement meets providers. Uh, you know, there's a lot of feedback we're getting from physicians and other providers um, that the measurement is kind of um, not really holistically connected to what they're doing. And so I think that there's a lot of uh, uh, desire to make it much more uh, flowing out of the process of care. <laughs> from the medical group perspective that um, I think Peggy's um, assessment is correct about the details, but I think she'd also agree, and I think the medical community would agree that anything that impacts 15, 18 percent of Medicare compensation providers will have a dramatic impact on the scope and the vision and how physicians um, engage uh, the value-based environment. We've been seeing in the last couple of years that um, there have been lots of fragmented small pay performance programs, but really no large-scale adoption. There's individual markets or exceptions, but no large-scale adoption of value-based uh, compensation models. And I think you see CMS taking the lead on that. Peggy's right that this will likely transform uh, the average 
providers' relationship with engaging in, in value-based services in the future. And I think what I would offer, in, in you know, addition to agreeing that it's too soon to tell what the uh, the impact or the outcome will be, is is what we hope it will be. And we hope we'll see it drive uh, in greater investment in infrastructure that leads to uh, increased beneficiary engagement. So, for example, utilization of shared care planning, uh, setting up the types of uh, vehicles that allow patients to engage in care design, so patient and family advisory councils, uh, for example, and uh, investment not just in setting these things up, but also in the tools and resources that practices need in order to learn how to do this. Uh, and also, you know, as we think about clinical improvement activities, we think about the potential for uh, how you can get almost a two-for-one deal. That, for example, if you're investing in your EHR to allow for uh, input of patient-generated data, how will that accelerate uh, being able to make it across the finish line in terms of patient reported outcomes data, patient experience measures that are able to come back to the provider uh, in, in a real-time feedback loop that allows them to make uh, more timely, let's say, uh, improvements in, in their practice of care rather than having to rely only on data that may come in significantly after point of care. Thanks, Lauren. So, um, so we have a viewer question, but before we get to that, I want to get to this rapid improvement and feedback uh, point because that that's another one of the principles in the NCQA framework. And um, can can each of you elaborate a little bit more on um, the importance of real time feedback to um, clinicians uh, as opposed to sort of a lag in getting the quality and cost data. Um, and uh, where are we with that? What's the future of that? And uh, what are your hopes for that? So I can address from a kind of a where we are now state. Uh, for physicians, say we get a patient satisfaction survey result that is a year and a half old. Now, how do we actually pursue a process of improvement? Do we wait a year and a half to then assess how we're doing? And what impact happened over that year and a half that made the difference? That's far too slow. And so most industries aren't burdened with this kind of time lag. And so we're not at a good place regards to real-time information. Um, we unfortunately have health systems that, and health information systems that were not created to provide real-time information across various silos. Certainly the uh, movement towards use and interconnectivity is health, but we still do have a long ways to go in providing that kind of real-time information. But until we're able to get it, we won't be able to make the kind of um, transformation that we really need where patients and physicians and providers, both of the team together, have the right information at the right time to make the right decisions. I mean, on, when we get the data at the point of care that people really need, then they will know, um, you know, with real-time information, what people, you know, which tests need to be done, which results are managed differently, um, who's in the hospital, um, who's about to go into the hospital. I mean, these things have to be done by providers that are cooperating. And even if we have meaningful use and we have the ability to do that, Somebody actually has to do it, and that's where a lot of the incentives come in. And what I would say is, you know, the, the potential of these real-time feedback loops, maybe circling back to one of your, uh, your first questions about uh, how do we really support a strong connection and relationship between a patient and a provider or a practice uh, or an alternative payment model like an ACO, Real-time uh, information feedback has potential to go a long way in really building that strong relationship. The patient will feel that they have been meaningfully engaged in terms of 
uh, through shared care planning or shared decision making, inputting some of that information in the beginning, uh, and then also providing that type of feedback as, say, a, a, a treatment plan carries on and seeing uh, their provider or the system respond to the information that they're giving them, uh, hopefully leading to a, a patient who walks away feeling like they've had a much uh, improved experience with their care uh, and feeling very satisfied, uh, not just with their health outcome, but with the experience of the care that they receive. Thank you. So let's, let's move on to a viewer question, um, which has to do with the impact of MACRA on payment for primary care embedded behavioral health in PCMHs. And so um, just to add on to that question, uh, if I understand correctly, the, um, the MIPS program can be extended to um, some additional types of uh, clinicians, such as social workers and psychologists, starting in 2021. So I'm wondering um, if the panelists can address um, how MACRA is going to, um, if, if at all, um, help to advance this um, practice of uh, integrating primary care and behavioral health. I'd like to say something about the collaborative care model that I think many of us have heard of. Um, where um, a primary care practice takes uh, takes responsibility for, uh, for example, depression care, and they're managing against outcomes. They're using registries. Um, they're using a care manager to supplement what the physician does. So, um, and they're using uh, referring uh, psychiatrists as necessary. Um, that actually it. it it's requiring a lot more work. That's one of the things that I think people don't really understand about patients at a medical home. We are asking them to take a lot of responsibility for their population of patients. It's a very different model from the old reactive model of, of primary care, which was more, you know, come to me when something is going wrong and I'll take care of your problem. This is much more comprehensive and it requires more of a team based. Uh, care, which requires hiring teams, training teams, using registries, and so forth, all of which is expensive, all of which leads me to say that I think if a practice is willing to adopt this model, there ought to be some recognition of that through the payment system. Well, I'll just add that the, the cruelty of this model is that the team members now in a team is to compete against each other. It is just, it's just so wrong, it's almost sad that we have to get the entire team on the same page with alignment on compensation and focused on what really matters, which is patient access, you know, high quality, and value-based delivery. And until we're able to find ways to compensate and address revenue for the entire team. And that includes you know, embedded behavioral health providers and you know, advanced practice providers, physicians, social workers, until we can create a system that incorporates all of those team members into a process of higher based value delivery of care, we're really gonna be behind the eight ball. Thanks, so let me, um... Let me, can I just add maybe one, one last point from the consumer's perspective uh, on that, which is that, and I'll, and I'll be brief, which is really uh, just the, the critical role that interdisciplinary care teams play. Again, kind of going back to, to the consumer, the success of payment reform will ultimately be in uh, the, the feeling that your care was better coordinated. With the consumer, that means a sort of comprehensive whole person look at care coordination. So the utilization of interdisciplinary care teams that include behavioral health specialists um, that facilitate linkages to community resources will be uh, really key here. And uh, the national partnership, something that we're very focused on as we respond to uh, various RFIs or other opportunities for comment on MACRA, is ensuring that when we say patients in a medical home or eligible alternative payment model that we're really honing in on making sure that um, in order to be eligible for that um, accreditation, I guess for lack of a better word, that you need to be able to, to uh, demonstrate that you are able to, to coordinate a patient's care across the sort of entire continuum, if you will. 
Great, thank you. So, um, so just to take that a little further, I do see differences in the MIPS and the alternative payment model alternatives for um, for physician practices as far as enhancing the ability to work together as a team, work across organizations, and then also address some of those community um, and social factors that you mentioned. Or is it too early to tell again? Well, I mean, I think that uh, the way we've designed the patient center medical home, it does encourage the practice to coordinate with the community resources. Um, you know, I think that when we're talking about highly complex patients, um, there needs to be some recognition of the added burden of trying to deal with social factors and so forth in the payment model. And I, I you know, I know that CMS is very aware of this and very concerned about it, and um, I feel confident that they will um, work on making sure that people aren't punished for taking care of the most complicated patients. And so let's go to that question about complicated patients and, and um, kind of tie it back to this question of core quality metrics. So um, how do we get to that set of core quality metrics um, that, um, that NCQ had mentioned in its white paper um, to make sure that um, that models can be compared across models. Um, and then are the quality metrics currently set up to account for people with multiple chronic conditions? So let me, uh, let me take that one. Um, I think if you look at what's being measured all over the country, um, you'll see very common conditions like diabetes, asthma, you'll see preventive services. So we, we really have all the ingredients for a core set of metrics. Sometimes they're specified differently and they need to be specified differently for different levels of the system and so forth. But um, there's, not, there's no mystery about that. Now, when you're talking about highly complicated patients, like frail elderly patients or people with disabilities and so on, these are kind of frontiers of measurement now. We're not really there yet. And I think this model um, needs to be evolved for these kinds of patients. We're working on this uh, ourselves at NCQA with funding from the Harker Foundation and the Stan Foundation. But when we talk about conditions, I think sometimes we're talking about people with diabetes and asthma and hypertension, and other times we're talking about people with um, Alzheimer's disease and you know, uh, you know, major organ system failures and so on. Those are quite different, and, and I think the latter really does require very different models. This is really more of a uh, complex. Uh, care management model than, than it is a PCMH model. So, and I expect and hope, and I think we're all hoping that the APMs um, will make room for this kind of uh, entity that can take care of these very complex patients. Uh, I just want to make one point that the APM side of this remains a little bit mysterious to us. You know, how what is it going to look like? We know that it means that organizations need to be willing to take down some of risk. That is to take responsibility uh, for spending the money and losing money if they don't manage it well. Um, but I think beyond that, we, we're still waiting uh, for that to be sorted out. And I do think that's going to take a while because um, it is so complicated and I think people want to be very deliberate about it. Thank you. So um, we have a viewer question, um, and it's uh, for Dr. Kerno, um, but anyone is welcome to jump in. Um, how do physicians really understand that Medicare replaced the SGR and what that really means in terms of change? And I might add to that and, and open it up to um, Lauren and to Peggy. Um, you know, the, the, the programs that MACRA kind of encompasses were relatively new in and of themselves. The, PQRS, or Physician Quality Reporting System, um, stems from 2006. The value-based modifier, um, only about five years old. Um, meaningful use incentives also um, just since, um, since the uh, Recovery Act. So these are all fairly new. So what do we know about those programs? Um, what have we learned so far? And uh, how, are, how are physicians and clinicians going to learn about these changes and how they affect them? And, and then how are they going to implement them? Well, I have this big Cheshire cat smile on my face because no, the doctors don't understand. Um, 
what's going on right now. Um, they remember the SGR. Uh, they remember the SGR because every so often people like myself, presidents of medical groups, would say, okay, you know, the government's not going to pay us for a little bit. We went through this cycle, this delightful three times a year cycle for about seven years. And doctors don't know what macro is. And it's really incumbent upon us to, those of us who want to um, move forward the agenda of value-based care, to use formats like this to help educate physicians. But at the end of the day, once revenue starts more closely aligning with physician behavior, team-based, team consumer-oriented behavior towards better healthcare delivery, physicians will understand it quickly. They're not, they're very knowledgeable, they're in situation, but it's been so much of the same for so long that doctors have been hearing about ACOs, and performance and value-based care since the mid-late 90s. And so there, a lot of doctors will say, well, this isn't going to really happen or something of the such, but it's here now. And we need to help doctors understand that once it becomes clear to them vis-a-vis -vis true transformations in technology and payment reform, I think they'll get on board very quickly. I think that one of the policy policymakers we need to take more seriously is that a possibly complicated policy that will work because people that have to be influencing don't get them. They don't they don't really understand what the behavior is to succeed. And um, I think this is true in the world of quality and it really behooves all of us to kind of figure out what's the clear message that each of the people in the delivery system is getting uh, from the citizens are sending, if they don't get it, then they, you know, they're not going to do what we want them to do. So we simplify we work better across the segments of the system, um, and um, we need to be, you know, much more uh, reflective in what is the life of the practitioner like, and it's not the same depending on if you're a primary care doctor, an orthopedic surgeon, a psychiatrist, and so forth. We have a lot to do to make a system much more clear in its expectations and user friendly for people that work in it. And I think from the consumer uh, community, you're seeing a, a pretty high level of engagement from consumer and patient advocacy groups. Uh, both around MACRA and around some of the uh, other delivery system and payment reform initiatives being piloted or implemented uh, by CMS, uh, particularly with the recent launching of the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network uh, and its consumer and patient affinity group, a real interest uh, from consumer groups in, in getting in at the forefront to help shape what we mean uh, by patient-centered medical home or what we, what we mean by alternative payment model to ensure that they're reflective of consumer and patient priorities and principles. Uh, and likewise, I think as, as we begin to really invest in the tools that patients and caregivers need in order to make more informed decisions about their choice of provider or their, uh, their treatment plan, uh, we will also see patients uh, hopefully become uh, more empowered uh, and engaged and uh, see a real sort of culture shift, if you will, in what we mean by the patient-provider relationship, both that, you know, requires change on behalf of how providers view patients and also how patients review their own role uh, in, in their care, uh, but certainly um, transparency around quality information, transparency around uh, cost and cost-effectiveness uh, will help uh, equip a more uh, informed patient. One of our experiences in the designing the patient center medical home and in the evolution of it, we did, um, we did focus groups. Um, and um, I, I remember this moment sitting, listening to these focus groups, these patients. And these were patients who had several chronic conditions, um, you know, like cancer and, and diabetes and so forth. And for these complicated patients, they totally got the concept. You know, I remember uh, somebody saying, 
my doctor has my back. Or, and another patient said, I don't let the specialist send me my reports anymore because it upsets me. I have them send it to the to the primary care doctor, and he puts it in contact with me. Uh, so I think you know we need to think about the the patient that that the user of and not make it too complicated. And and that's one of the beauties of the patient center medical home is it pulls all this complicated uh, mess of the system we have, and it, it makes it much more uh, user friendly for the patient, particularly. Thank you. So each of you has mentioned transparency, and um, before we get to the end of the um, session, and uh, I'd like to ask about transparency and how we can make sure that quality and cost measures um, can result in, in report cards or some kind of usable uh, metric so that consumers can use them. And, and what should the metric be? Should it be the MA star rating? Should it be some other kind of uh, composite measure? Uh, and, and where should we go with that? Uh, I mean, I think uh, the STAR system, you know, it's not perfect, it's evolving. Um, it, it actually is pretty clear to patients, and if we look at the, the pattern of, uh, of use, it does drive people towards the higher STAR ratings and so forth. So um, I think that's one thing that we've learned. On the cost side, I don't think we want to show patients a whole lot of cost measures. I think the costs will be reflected in what they're paying which is a very, very salient way of telling them what's more affordable. You know, they, patients pay a lot of attention to costs, um, particularly sick patients and particularly people that have limited incomes where they may be trading off between things that, that make their lives better that are not health care and health care. So um, I'm confident that we can take the complex information that we develop through this and turn it into something that is actually pretty user friendly. But I do think that at the moment, it's, it's a time of, uh, we're asking an awful lot of consumers in terms of their choices and, you know, all the different uh, network choices and so forth. It's pretty overwhelming for patients. Um, Medicare, I think, in general is less so, but I hope we, we keep it less so, so that people can be clear about what they're buying and what they're paying. I appreciate those comments a lot, Peggy. I, I think from the consumer's perspective, we're very much uh, in alignment uh, with a lot of what uh, Peggy just said in terms of making sure that it's not just that the data is accessible, but that it's accessible in a consumer-friendly manner. So it's everything from, uh, you know, what measures are we using? Are we capturing the type of quality information that is most meaningful to consumers? So in addition to clinical processes or clinical outcomes, how are we moving the ball forward on patient experience and patient report uh, outcomes and patient reported data uh, to how are those measured, uh, those measure quality ratings made available to the consumer. Uh, is the interface uh, legible and uh, understandable to the consumer? Can the consumer access that information and actually apply it uh, when they're trying to make a decision about uh, this doctor versus that doctor or this treatment course versus that one? Uh, in addition to quality information, consumers are very hungry, certainly, for more transparency um, around price. Uh, and, you know, we use the term price uh, perhaps as opposed to cost, um, since the consumer, it very much is. What is the price I'm paying for this, uh, which may or may not uh, be related to the actual underlying cost. So uh, we certainly see a lot of uh, potential here and are certainly very aligned um, and appreciate the commitment that uh, NCQA has, has made uh, towards enhanced transparency and would just, you know, continue to say, to the extent that the consumer can be involved throughout the process uh, will only ensure that we have, at the end of the day, uh, information that's displayed in a way that consumers can actually use it uh, and therefore hopefully make more value-driven decisions. Thanks. So from, the, so from the provider perspective, just quickly, the um, issue of transparency is a welcomed one, but um, unfortunately complicated. We um, have a, we just spoke earlier about um, problems of real-time information, and I don't think providers, um, I think providers embrace the concept of transparency, but the key is going to be making sure the measures are accurate and make sure they're consistent across the payers, um, and 
make sure that the sample size, I don't want to get technical, but make sure that the sample sizes are appropriate. Um, it's hard to say one physician is um, higher ranking on a quality measure than another when the sample size is five, physician, five, five patients per physician. And so I think that's why the ACOs are so important, that we can aggregate lives in an accountable care organization. An accountable care organization could manage patients and assessing the ability of maybe perhaps a large medical group or a ACO to provide quality health care for a small complex population then assigning it somewhat arbitrarily to a physician when their sample size is too small. Those are um, idiosyncratic discussions, but suffice it to say, we have to do a lot of work at understanding what we're defining um, and getting buy-in from an understanding of both the consumers and the physicians. That's easily obtainable once we kind of put our mind to it, but it is complex right now because there's so many different people and so many different measures for the different pairs that it becomes quite confusing for, I think, physicians and probably consumers as well. Thanks. Does anyone else want to comment on that point that Dr. Hernandez just made about sort of levels of accountability and how um, should quality metrics be aligned at different levels of accountability? Well, it's kind of, I mean, I think, yes, you want to have, you want to have measures for plans. You want to have measures for ACOs or whatever the entities are called that are going to take this downside risk that are bigger than individual practices. And then you want something about individual doctors, although I think there are many, many issues. What Randy was just saying about, you know, people developing measures based on five patients, that, that doesn't really hold water. That really isn't, you know, because five patients you may get very much data. And so you have a big confidence interval around the number, and it may not be fair what the average is. So um, I think that, you know, while people want information about doctors, there are things that we can give them about doctors based on the patient experience and so forth. And there are other things where, especially if you're talking about a model where we use teams, it's really not the individual doctor. So we've got to be very discerning. And this is kind of, this is, we, we really, uh, you know, the American public is used to, we're all kind of still thinking about Marcus Welby, and Marcus Welby is not going to be the thing, the delivery model in the future. And so we kind of need to adjust our expectations while holding uh, physicians accountable for things that we can measure fairly. And I think certainly, you know, at the end of the day, we agree with ensuring that, uh, you know, there's data integrity and that we are measuring fairly. Um, I would push a little to say that to the extent that we can get to a reliable uh, clinician level, facility level measures, that's uh, what's often optimal from the patient's point of view. Uh, since even if that patient is in a larger ACO, uh, there's a high likelihood that they're most interested in uh, the, the quality performance of the doctor that they are seeing that day, as opposed to, for example, the ACO. Um, there's just a sort of ongoing level of, of wanting to uh, be able to trust the provider that you're sitting face to face with um, and not necessarily have to take a, a sort of system's word for it, if you will. Well, absolutely. And, you know, for many types of doctors, we can have that kind of information. It depends on what the doctor is doing. If the doctor is a surgeon, we can get better information than we can if they're a general practitioner, a primary care doctor, um, about what they do. So it depends, and I, I agree with you that uh, the, the lower we can go in, in the system, the more we can drill down and do a fair job of assessing that, then we want that. But I think as we go to the ACO model or, or whatever the, the entity is going to be called, um, it, they will make it their business too to make sure that their practitioners are doing a good job because it will reflect on the overall performance of the system. So I don't disagree with you, Lauren. I, I, I definitely agree with you. And nor, Lauren, nor do I. I. I think you're exactly on track. I think that Peggy used the word discerning. Um, and we, I think also the key is going to be identifying what it is. I don't think we should abdicate, to your point, Lauren, we shouldn't abdicate the ability to give consumers information 
and for, and for physicians and teams have information so that they can improve their own quality delivery. Um, I think what we need to do is we need to identify what, what it is exactly that a primary care physician needs to do in order to make sure a patient is engaged in the care, understands the care they're delivered, and gets a good outcome. And what are things that we can assess an individual provider for to make sure that happens? And I think that's where really the discernment comes in is creating metrics that are relevant to what the team is actually doing at the, at the point of delivery. And it, to your point, Lauren, it's not going, well, you know, we can't measure it easily, so we're just not going to worry about it. We need to find out what parts of the care delivery chain best impact and at what point that occurs and be able to measure the success of that individual unit of uh, process. Uh, we very much uh, appreciate that and I think are very aligned and, you know, hope that, for example, the, the measure development plan that CMS will be issuing as part of MACRA will address exactly some of these things. Um, also, particularly, you know, the, the point was raised um, around how are consumers going to be able uh, to be equipped to be able to compare a physician who may be in MIPS with a physician who may be in the APM track. So, you know, ensuring that the measures that we are uh, thinking about speak to exactly some of those points of discernment um, that you both have raised, uh, but also hopefully eventually <laughs> get us to a place where consumers do have that individual level um, type information so that they can make those. Uh, comparisons. Great. Well, Laura, well, I think that the, I think, Laura, just to believe, I think that the, the thing that we'll need to get to, I'm sorry, Sarah, is that, that I would be remiss if I didn't speak for the physician community in that, um, that the, often the questions physicians ask me, well, you know, what if the patient doesn't want to do what I recommend? I think that's um, sometimes a, um, a straw man that physicians create to obfuscate the issue, but it is a real issue, and I think that's why it's important to identify the distinction between a process measure and an outcome measure. And there's an inordinate amount of room for us to create more, more effectual, more impactful process and outcome measures to help drive this transparency. Well, Thank you. That's great. And I think we are getting close to the end of the hour here. So um, what I'm going to ask each of you to do is uh, if you have any final um, words that you'd like to say about this, lots of questions obviously moving forward. And uh, we did have a final viewer question about shared decision making and kind of whether the quality measures that exist now are going to be able to capture some of what you were just talking about um, as far as shared decision making and whether um, something is not done in the clinical setting as well as whether something is done. So I think it gets to that overuse, underuse question. So uh, if anyone wants to weave that into their um, closing remarks, that would be great. Uh, otherwise, we'll let you wrap it up. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just saying I can tie into that. At the end of the day, we're talking about how do we get medical delivery teams and patients to truly engage in a conversation about the patient's health. And that's what all this is about. And the sooner we, the sooner we can align all the and ensure that there are meaningful conversations about the right care at the right place at the right time by the right people on behalf of patients and having them engage in that process, that's really the core of what the medical home and what value-based delivery is. I think Macro is a step in the right direction and um, long overdue. And I'm about to go next so that Peggy, you can have the, the last word here. Um, but I, I fully agree with that statement. I, I think every time uh, I participate in some of these multi stakeholder panels, I'm I'm always struck by the amount of alignment um, with regards to the, the goal. Uh, and so we have a you know same and aligned goal around seeing MACRA as uh, hopefully the vehicle uh, that gets us to the investment in uh, shared decision making and shared care planning uh, in uh, 
advanced uh, use of electronic health records and health information technology, uh, all of which are tools that enable exactly that type of conversation uh, between the provider and the patient or the patient's family caregiver uh, that allow there to be a real partnership there and an ongoing dialogue to ensure that uh, the care is uh, meeting uh, both the, the clinical goals but also the, the maybe personal uh, goals of the patient uh, or the caregiver. So I, I would say uh, again how excited we are that we're at this moment of opportunity to really think about the way we deliver care and the way we pay physicians and having recognized what Randy was talking about, about the tyranny of the fee-for-service system now trying to start the clean slate and really enable a payment system that supports all our goals, including shared decision making. So, I mean, you think about decision making, think of it as a woman that had a hysterectomy. Um, so maybe she had the hysterectomy and she had a good outcome and she's quite satisfied, but maybe she didn't need the hysterectomy, you know. So I think that there, there are not, there's not an easy answer about how shared decision making figures into our, our measurement agenda, and it can, it can be thought of separately, and I don't know how to think about it in an integrated way, but it's clearly very important that people not get unnecessary care, um, and they, that they be told the full story about their range of treatment options, and that we allow them to make the choice that's really the best for them. And I think that will happen, we'll get there, but I don't have a, a you know, a, a sort of sound bite about how quality measurement is going to address that issue right now. But meanwhile, I think we are at a moment of tremendous opportunity, and we really welcome the opportunity to work with all of you that, that are listening in and that are being sent questions, and thank you for coming. And thank you to Lauren and Randy for and to Sarah. Great. Well, thank you so much, Peggy, and um, again, thank you to our audience. Um, thank you to NCQA for hosting this Google Hangout. Thanks to Lauren Kennedy from the National Partnership for Women and Families and Dr. Randy Kerno from Mercy um, Physicians uh, for engaging in this really thoughtful and constructive conversation about a really complicated topic. Uh, if you do want to learn more um, about the, the uh, RFI that um, CMS has put out, as, as Peggy mentioned, um, and you can go to um, ncqa.org forward slash public policy forward slash macro and learn more about that. And uh, of course, you can look back on this Twitter conversation, hashtag macrovision. So um, with that, uh, I will close um, these, this Google Hangout and thank you all again for, for participating.